Today we're looking at Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. First Corinthians is our book in the New Testament. We're looking at chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. First Corinthians, Paul, the first of two letters in the New Testament addressed to the Corinthian church. First Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25. Today I'm reading from the message translation by the late great Eugene Peterson. And as is my custom, I invite you to listen closely for the word of God. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out, it's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as shams. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world is, since the world and all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God. God, in his wisdom, took delight in using what the world considered stupid preaching of all things to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God, God's Son, both Jews and Greeks. Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so cheap, so impotent, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. The word of the Lord. Let's ponder and inquire for a little while under the theme that God's wisdom brings renewal. God's wisdom 
springs in Newell. We continue in our journey during the season of Lent in 2024. It is a 40 day journey, as most of us well know. And its purpose is to prepare us for Jesus' resurrection. That's what we're doing. We're attempting to get our heads right and our hearts right to celebrate again the miracle of Jesus' coming out of the tomb after having been crucified, proclaiming that he held all power in his hands and demonstrating that the kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdoms of this world. Is anybody here? I said that the kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdoms of this world. Uh -huh. Because the kingdoms of this world are oppressive. The kingdoms of this world try to tell us that some people are more important than other people. The kingdoms of this world try to sell us on the idea that the goal of our life is a helicopter or a private jet or a yacht. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world, as Dr. King said, are governed by three triplets who are very proud. You know what those triplets are? Some of you know. He said it was racism, militarism, and consumerism. Those are the kingdoms of this world. The monetary and the military. Somebody heard. Look at what's going on in Palestine right now. We are witnessing a genocide. This morning, I think the count went up to 30,000 Palestinians who have been murdered since October 7th. Two thirds of them women and children. Someone else said that two Palestinian mothers are killed every hour. The kingdoms of this world. And the president of this country is deeply involved. Providing weapons and money not simply complicit in the genocide, but co-partnered in the genocide. The kingdom of God is better than the kingdoms of this world. This is the message that Paul was attempting to deliver to the people in the Corinthian church who are having a hard time accepting a crucified Christ. They were really struggling with that idea. Crucifixion was a very ignominious way to die during their time. 
It was shrouded in, in shame. It was the thing that shook people down to their soul. Something Rome, only Rome could do, even if you remember the story when, 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 when the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted Jesus to die, they, they knew they could not put him on cross. That was only reserved for a Roman governor. Because that death penalty was only, uh, uh, it was a demonstration of Rome's ultimate power over everything and it got at the deepest fear that people typically carry the fear of death the fear of death haunts us who live we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money are trying to keep the fear of death at bay. This is one of the reasons why the culture of youth is so rampant in this country. No one wants to look their age. Because the more we look like our age as we advance, the closer we are to that time of death. And we spend money to wipe away the wrinkles or surgically remove them. Or we're sold products on television you can defeat the aging process. Good luck. <laughs> How's that working for you? <laughs> Your wallet might be lighter, but you ain't no younger. The body knows. Does it? Yes. yes. Body no. But it's all, I don't want to look like I'm getting closer to that time when I'm going to make my transition. I want to be young and youthful. I want to have a child spirit. Good luck. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, though, no matter what you may look like on the outside, the body knows. Because we're trying to push in the other direction from death. We act as if all of what's here is all there is. And that's where Paul says human intelligence fails. In every gathering of spiritual people, the question is of what happens after we die, it always comes up and it always has to be asked. No matter what tradition, there is uh, a lot of conversation and a lot of reflection and a, a, a lot of information around what happens after we die. In Buddhism, there is the idea of impermanence. The idea that we should not 
cling or hold on to anything in this life because eventually all things go away. Whatever you hold on to for dear life and cannot possibly ever let go, that is the place where your life can be frozen and ossified. The idea of impermanence says there's a flow. Things come and then things move on and then we come and then we move on. It's all part of the flow. And if you try to hold on too tight, you interrupt it. In some forms of Hinduism, there is an idea that, that we are reincarnated after we make our transition. That humanity is a part of life's energy and and then after we lay the body down, we may come back again as some other created thing, maybe even another human. It's one of the ways of answering the question, what happens after we die? In Islam, it's believed that once one transition out of the body, they go into a place called paradise, where life is sweet and beautiful. And men are promised 72 virgins once they get there. That, that's really interesting. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the promise for women is. I don't know if 72 guys, I don't know if that would be paradise, you know. Maybe not. <laughs> 72 dudes saying, where's my dinner? and the transition and the place of the ancestor spirits that can, continues to live with the people and also in many forms of the African cosmos uh, humans do come back as animals or as uh, vegetation or other things right they represent themselves not just as human but as other created things as well but in Christian faith, we have this scandal right at the center of what we say happens after we die in this the cross. This symbol of the Roman death penalty. Now we haven't lived in a world where people are openly crucified on crosses, and that's done in other ways, but not on crosses. And during the time that Paul is writing this letter, uh, the people of Corinth did witness people being crucified for their belief in Jesus Christ. It was a fear. where people had transferred their ultimate uh, sense of authority from God and to Caesar. That they lived their lives in a way uh, under the shadow of the Roman Empire trying to find out what is the way to not make the Romans unhappy or ups upset with me. How, how to get in to, to, to the place that the Romans want me to fit in and to live according to the strictures of empire instead of the directions of God. Paul knew that something had to be said 
about this, to give them another way of viewing the cross, another way of viewing Jesus' crucifixion, another way that is greater than human wisdom about what to believe after we die. Paul says in so many words, in a crucified Christ, you may see defeat, but I see victory. In a crucified Christ, you may be terrorized, but I am hopeful. In a crucified Christ, you may see the end, but I see the beginning. Because the cross of Rome did not defeat Jesus. The cross of Rome did not defeat Jesus. That thing that you fear the most isn't the end. The, the ultimate expression of Roman power is weakness in comparison to the power of God. Who can take the one you kill, stand him back up on his feet, proclaiming he has all power in his hands. It may seem to be good sense to live low with your head down, but that's not God's sense. God says you, have, says you have no ruler but the creator of all things. You should not bow down to any human created systems. Racism should not define how you look at yourself or look at the world. Militarism should not be the way that you decide to solve your problems. And consumerism won't save you. Judging yourself by what you have. Because the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdoms of this world. Crucifixion was in Rome was only reserved for freedom fighters and activists. Regular petty crime, your sentence would never be crucifixion. The crucified were those whom Rome feared will upset the peace of Rome and its power over its colonies and the colonized. So when Rome snatches someone who is believed to be about justice, and Rome falsely accuses them and Rome imprisons them, and Rome puts them in a kangaroo court and convicts them. And then when Rome hangs them high and stretches them wide, the, the, the message is, see now what happens when you don't tell the lie. I'm reminded of what I'm told about what would happen sometimes on plantations. When our people refuse to obey NASA. Some organized strikes. Did you know that? Uh -huh. Some set the crops on fire. Did you know that? Some put poison in NASA's food. Did you know that? 
some uh, try to explain to NASA why some of the stock kept dying and nobody knew why. You all heard about melatosis? You don't know? Okay. So, so one day, you know, the enslaver comes and there's a pig lying dead, you know, in the stockyard. And uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, what happened here? And uh, one of the enslaved say, malatosis. And the enslaver says, malatosis. He said, yeah, you, you don't really want to eat that after malatosis. And he said, well, okay, okay, well, well, well you take it, y'all, y'all get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. Okay, about a month later, there's a cow laying out dead. And the enslaver said, no, no, what happened to my cow? And they said, malatosis, boss. It happened again. And, and you, you really don't want to eat that. You'll get sick, your children will get sick, the missus will get sick. We'll take it away for you, boss. Okay. So y'all know what malatosis was, right? You take a mallet, way early in the morning when no one's around. Wow! Malatosis. And then the community gets food. Uh -huh. So we can eat. But if you got caught with your man, like Jesus, you would be publicly crucified. They would gather around all of the people who were enslaved so that they could see what happens when you don't follow the rules. And sometimes people from neighboring plantations would bring their enslaved to witness the crucifixion so that the message would be sent. This is what happens when you don't follow the rules of the empire. So that's what happened to Jesus. And this is why the Jewish members of the church had such a problem and why the Greek members of the church had such a problem and why Paul said God's wisdom can lead to your renewal. Yes, he went to that cross. He was crucified. He died. They placed him in a tomb and he laid there on Friday night. And he laid there on Saturday. But early on Sunday the stone of the tomb was rolled away. He walked out of there. He wasn't wearing his great clothes. And he said, I have all power in my hands. What seems wise to you is not wisdom. God's wisdom is greater than the wisdom of the world. Place this in your hope that you can win while you live and follow God instead of the rules of evil people. And if it causes you, like it caused Mark, like it caused Malcolm, like it caused Edgar.
to be placed on the cross. I could cause Sandra Bland. To be placed on the cross. God's victory is still yours and still ours. You put off the physical body. You put on the spiritual body. You go from the physical world to the world of the spirit. From there, you continue to have presence and power in the family and in the community. And from there, as Pope Francis said, your powers and your prayers and your actions keep the door from heaven open between heaven and earth. And that is your life forevermore. There is not loss one follows God. There is not loss when one questions the wisdom of the world and puts it away in favor of eternal wisdom. There is not loss when we lay this body down to take up our spiritual selves eternal in the heavens. There is not loss There is renewal. There is new life. There is hope. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.